forward of richard strauss this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales richard strauss by herbert f peaser forward the writer of a thumbnail biography of richard strauss finds himself confronted with a troublesome assignment strauss lived well beyond the scriptural age allotted the average man he would have been eighty-six had he reached his next birthday there was nothing romantic or sensational about his passing for he died of a complication of the illnesses of old age there was not much truly spectacular about the course of his life which was most happily free from the material troubles which bedeviled the existence of so many great masters and he was not called upon to starve or to struggle to achieve the material rewards of his gifts he had not to pass through the conflicts which embittered the lives of wagner or berlioz and he was never compelled to suffer like mozart or schubert there is no record of his ever humiliating himself or performing degrading chores for publishers in return for a wretched pittance he had wealth enough without compromising his art to keep the pot boiling and for this one can only feel devoutly thankful what if he was taxed with sensationalism how many of the masters of music has not had at one time or another to endure this reproach if Salome and Electra, Ein Heldenleben and Till Eulenspiegel were in their day scandalously sensational, did not the whirligig of time reveal them as incontestable products of genius, irrespective of any qualities and flaws? However, Richard Strauss compares in the last analysis with this or that master, he contributed to the language of music idioms, procedures, and technical accomplishments typical of the confused years and conflicting ideals out of which they were born. His works are most decidedly of an age, whether or not they are for all time. In a way, he was almost as fortunate as Mendelssohn. Need anyone begrudge him this? HFP end of forward part 1 of richard strauss by herbert f peaser this librivox recording is in the public domain the late spring of 1864 brought two events which though seemingly unrelated actually had a kind of mystic kinship and were to stir the surfaces of music Early in May of that year, Richard Wagner was summoned to Munich to become the friend and protégé of the young Bavarian sovereign, Ludwig II, whose real mission on earth was to save the composer for the world. Hardly more than a month later, there was born in the same city a boy likewise named Richard, who was destined in the fullness of time to become in a sense an heir and continuator of the old master, though by no means a vain copy of his artistic and spiritual lineaments. And long before the span of his days reached its end, he had taken an undisputed place in history as a seminal force in music for all the disagreements and conflicts his art was to engender through a large part of his more than fourscore years richard strauss first saw the light on june eleventh eighteen sixty four in a house on the altheimer eck munich at the centre of the town and a stone's throw from the twin steeples of the frauenkirche the edifice in which the future composer of Salome, Electra, and Der Rosenkavalier was born forms a part of a complex of buildings in which a number of larger and smaller beer halls and restaurants, separated by cobbled courtyards, house the brewery of Georg Schor, Sr., whose son, Georg Schor, Jr., enlarged the establishment furthermore he improved the quality of its products till shorebrow beer became it seemed to many including the writer of these pages the most incomparable refreshment this side of heaven despite the close proximity of the hofbrau house the Löwenbräu, the augustinerbrau and the unnumbered other munich breweries and affiliated beerstuben 
at this point the writer ought logically to confess that he bases his present recollections on what he remembers from his wanderings in the bavarian capital prior to the second world war since which time changes without number may well have changed the picture but one thing is reasonably certain if the old house at altheimer eck number two still stands it continues to have affixed to its wall the decorative inscription am eleven juni eighteen sixty four wurde hier richard strauss geboren on june eleven eighteen sixty four richard strauss was born here the shores apart from being excellent brewers were excellent musicians one of the four daughters josephine later richard's mother a fairly accomplished pianist taught her son piano in his fifth year a noted harpist august tombo continued the lessons and by the time the boy was seven he was administered violin instruction franz strauss richard's father was an individual of a fibre as tough as josephine shore who became his wife was mild-mannered and sensitive but he was an amazingly fine horn player for the sake of whose virtuosity and musicianship greater men than he put up with his ill manners and incredible tantrums a venomous reactionary his particular detestation was wagner against whom he never hesitated to exhibit the meanest traits of which he was capable even when the author of tristan expressed himself as overjoyed with the sound of the orchestra at a first rehearsal of his work in the little residenz theatre franz strauss retorted that's not true it sounded like an old tin kettle he pronounced wagner's horn parts unplayable so that wagner had to call upon hans richter to try out for him some passages in die meistersinger in order to demonstrate that they were anything but impossible with the elder strauss hans von bulow was repeatedly at loggerheads and when he once attempted to thank bulow for some favor the latter had shown young richard strauss bulow exploded with the words you have no right to thank me i did your son a favor not on your account but only because i consider his talent deserves it to the end of his days franz strauss remained a cantankerous individual young richard may not have exhibited the precocity of a mozart or a mendelssohn but there could be no doubt that musical impulses stirred in the child he piled up a considerable quantity of juvenilia beginning as a six-year-old in eighteen seventy one he turned out a schneider polka a taylor's polka there followed dance pieces for piano wedding music for keyboard and children's instruments some marches and more miscellany of the sort it was related by his naturally proud relations that the lad could write notes even before he had learned the alphabet there would be no particular point in detailing these boyish accomplishments yet when richard was twelve an uncle paid for the publication by Bratkopf und Hertel of a festival march which gained the distinction of appearing as opus one it need hardly be said that he participated in domestic performances of chamber music with regularity all the same his schoolwork maintained a high level even if it did not consume a needless amount of time he also found leisure to jot in the pages of his mathematics copy-book whole passages of a violin concerto which appears to have been set down during his classroom lessons according to his biographer willy brandel the piece was written so rapidly that the student contrived a three-line staff instead of the usual five-line one at this period his musical tastes were colored by those of his father thus there is no reason for surprise that the compositions he turned out up to the end of his high school days were the customary platitudes of classical and romantic models especially schumann and mendelssohn were rather colorlessly reflected in the products the youth fashioned even considering his father's poisonous detestation of wagner it still remains hard to grasp how weak was the pressure the creator of tristan und meistersinger exercised on the sun precisely when the wagnerian idiom was beginning to permeate the language of music 
more than that it took time for the boy strauss to rid his system of the ludicrous prejudices he parroted for a while to his friend the composer ludwig twilly he confided the lohengrin which he heard at fifteen was sweet and sickly in all but the action and after his first exposure to siegfried he lamented that he was more cruelly bored than i can tell then he concluded with this burst of prophecy you can be assured that in ten years nobody will remember who richard wagner was young strauss was to outlive such heresies by the sensible process of steeping himself in wagner's scores rather than by viewing inadequate performances as truths of holy writ it is hardly necessary to emphasize the dismay of franz strauss as little by little he became aware of the turn things were taking he who had striven to bring up his son in his own philistine ways was gradually brought face to face with the upsetting fact that the young man might be getting out of hand richard was no music school or conservatory pupil and had presumably none too many academic precepts to unlearn one advantage of this was that nothing tempted him to cut short other phases of his education and in the autumn of eighteen eighty two he began to attend philosophical literary and other cultural lectures at the university of munich so that there were no serious gaps in his schooling he continued to compose industriously a chorus in the electra of sophocles was one of his creations in this period but in after years he warned against rushing before the public with unripe efforts subsequently he visited upon the works of his salad days this judgment in them i lost much real freshness and force so much for those who question even today the soundness of this early verdict one advantage he came early to enjoy the good will of hermann levy the munich conductor or let us give him his more imposing official title of general music director who first presided in bayreuth over wagner's parsifal in eighteen eighty one the outstanding chamber music organization of the bavarian capital performed a string quartet of young strauss and very shortly afterwards levy sponsored the first public hearing of a rather more ambitious effort a symphony in d minor before a capacity audience the noted conductor went so far as to congratulate the high school student it should be set down to the credit of the scarcely seventeen-year-old composer that he did not for a moment suffer the tribute to turn his head next morning the student was back in his classroom as unconcerned with his triumphs of the preceding evening as if they had all been no more than an agreeable dream the usually peppery father appears to have been somewhat less balanced than his son and a little earlier took it upon himself to dispatch richard's serenade for wind instruments opus seven to hans von bulow not a genius but at the most a talent of the kind that grows on every bush shot back the latter after a glimpse at the score of this adolescent production but bulow's irritable mood softened before long and he was considerably more flattering about other of the composer's works which came to his attention all the same bulow grew to like the serenade well enough to make room for it on one of his programs meantime on november twenty seventh eighteen eighty two franz wurner produced it in dresden it was a strange quirk of fate which made of this piece the unexpected vehicle for richard's first exploit as a conductor it happened that bulow eventually scheduled it eighteen eighty four for one of his concerts at the eleventh hour the older musician suffering from an indisposition appealed to his young friend to direct his own work trusting to luck richard suffered a baton to be thrust into his hands and almost in a dream state hardly knowing how things would turn out piloted the players through the score all that i realize he afterwards said is that i did not break down 
young strauss was not idling the products of his energetic young manhood if they do not bulk large in his exploits indicate clearly how carefully he was striving to learn his craft without at the same time seeking to blaze trails one finds him turning out in eighteen eighty one five piano pieces as well as the string quartet just mentioned a piano sonata a sonata for cello and piano a concerto for violin and orchestra mood pictures for piano a concerto for horn and orchestra and a symphony in f minor this symphony incidentally was first produced by theodore thomas on december thirteenth eighteen eighty four at a concert of the new york philharmonic society perhaps more important however were the songs strauss was writing at this stage for they preserved a vitality which strauss's instrumental products of that early period have long since lost it is not easy to grasp at this date that it was the early strauss the world was to thank for such masterpieces of song literature as the incorrigibly popular one might almost say hackneyed leader as zuignung die nacht die georgine geduld allerseelen stenchen and a number of other such lyric specimens many of them in the truest tradition of the german art song indeed the boldness the diversity declamatory rhythmic and melodic features of strauss's achievements in this field might almost be said to have preceded the more sensational aspects of his orchestral work the songs of strauss the earliest specimens of which date from eighteen eighty two and which span though in steadily diminishing numbers the most fruitful years of his life aggregate something like a hundred and fifty if the better known ones are with piano accompaniment not a few are scored for an orchestral one a large number long ago became musical household words along with the leader of schubert schumann and brahms though having a physiognomy quite their own the woman who became his wife pauline de Anya, was an accomplished vocalist and that circumstance goes far to account for the diversity of his efforts in this province the joint recitals of the pair stimulated for a considerable period the composer's lyric imagination if his inspiration eventually sought expression in larger frames it must be noted that the slant of his genius habitually ran to larger conceptions in any event the liederabende of strauss and his betrothed help explain the creative impulses which at this stage found so much of their outlet in song-writing the composer was later to explain that a new song might be dashed off at any halfway idle moment might even be scribbled down in the twinkling of an eye between the acts of an opera performance or during a concert intermission and as spontaneously as schubert richard strauss busied himself with poems of the most varied character on the young man's twenty-first birthday hans von bulow recommended to duke georg of meiningen an uncommonly gifted musician as substitute while he himself went on a journey for his shattered health bulow referred to the suggested deputy as richard three since after richard wagner there could be no richard ii strauss arrived in meiningen in october eighteen eighty five the little ducal capital boasted a high artistic standing its theatrical company enjoyed international fame the town to be sure had no opera but the orchestra though numbering only forty-eight instrumentalists had been so trained by the suffering yet exigent bulow that it was virtually unrivalled in germany the newcomer was encouraged to submit under his mentor's eye to an intensive training bulow's rehearsals ran from nine in the morning till one in the afternoon and his disciple from munich was invariably on hand from the first to the last note the rest of the day was devoted to score reading and to every subtlety of conductor's technique the young man was absolutely overwhelmed by the exhaustive manner in which bulow sought out the ultimate poetic content of the scores of beethoven and wagner and a favorite saying of the older musician was never to be forgotten by his disciple from munich 
First, learn to read the score of a Beethoven symphony with absolute correctness, and you will already have its interpretation. Strauss made other friends and valuable connections in Meiningen. One of the most important and influential of these was an impassioned devotee of Wagner, Alexander Ritter. Like so many apostles of the creator of Parsifal at that period, Ritter was a violent opponent of Brahms. Besides, he was the composer of a comic opera, Der Faule Hans, and of a symphonic poem that once enjoyed a vogue in Germany, Kaiser Rudolf Ritt zum Grabe. It was Ritter's service to familiarize Strauss with some of the deepest secrets of the scores and writings of Wagner, as well as of Liszt, and he understood how to fire his young friend with soaring enthusiasm for his own ideals. He also did much to inspire the budding conductor with a taste for the writings of Schopenhauer, an inclination he himself had inherited from Wagner. Ritter's influence, in short, was one of the luckiest developments at this stage of Strauss's career. The first concert the youth from Munich conducted in Meiningen took place on October 18, 1885. It afforded him a chance to exploit his talents as pianist and batonist, as well as composer, what with a program that included Beethoven's Coriolanus Overture and Seventh Symphony, Mozart's C minor Piano Concerto, and that F minor symphony of his own, which Theodor Thomas had conducted the previous year in New York. Strauss had every reason to be pleased with the outcome. Bülow, speaking of his debut as pianist and conductor, had referred to it as Gerade zu verblüffend, simply stunning. Even the hard-shelled Brahms, who chanced to be on hand, had deigned to encourage him with a cordial, very nice young man, when, on December 1 of that year, Bülow gave up the orchestra's leadership, Strauss inherited the post, conducted all concerts, and had to direct, sometimes on the spur of the moment, almost anything this or that high-priced personage might suddenly take a fancy to hear. With the courage of despair, he repeatedly attempted compositions he hardly knew or had not directed publicly yet he never made a botch of the job, inwardly as he may have quaked. To this period belongs a composition which has survived, and at intervals turns up on our symphonic programs, the curious burlesque for piano and orchestra. The piece is something of a problem, but it is one of the most yeasty and original products of its composer's youth. It possesses a type of wit and bold humor worthy of the subsequent author of Till Eulenspiegel. If it still betrays Brahmsian influences, some of those dialogues between piano and kettle drums depart sharply from the more flabby romantic effusions of the youth who still clung to the coattails of Schumann, Mendelssohn, and some lesser romantics. Rightly or wrongly, the composer always harbored a dislike for the burlesque, though when he created it, his original instinct led him aright, if more or less unconsciously. Not till four years later did the pianist Eugen Dalbert give it a public hearing in Eisenach. At that, Strauss himself never brought himself to dignify the burlesque with an opus number, and insisted he would not have consented to its publication but for his need of funds. Today the saucy little score seems more alive than certain other early efforts, which were rather closer to their composer's heart. Meiningen had been a sort of stepping stone. Strongly against the advice of Hans von Bülow, who detested Munich from the depths of his being, Strauss nevertheless accepted a conductor's post in his native city, where he had the advantage of continuing his stimulating contact with Alexander Ritter, who had followed him to the Bavarian capital. Yet he did not look forward to a Munich position with particular joy. Before entering on his duties, he permitted himself a vacation in Naples and Sorrento. In Munich, he found the Royal Court Theater bogged down in a morass of routine. The musical direction of that establishment, though in the capable hands of Hermann Levy, was unfired by real enthusiasm, let alone true inspiration. The first of Strauss's official assignments was the direction of 
Boydieu's opera comique Jean de Paris, and a quantity of similar old and harmless pieces. One promised duty which augured well was a production of Wagner's boyhood opera, Die Fiene. He would probably never have been promised anything so rewarding had not the conductor for whom it had been intended in the first place fallen ill. But even this unusual prize was in the end snatched from his grasp, after he had presided over the rehearsals. At the last moment the direction of the Wagner curio was assigned to a certain fisher. There was a managerial conference concerning the matter, at which, we are told, Strauss was like a lioness defending her young. But the intendant put a stop to the argument by announcing that he disliked conducting in the Bulow style, and that, moreover, Strauss was becoming intolerable because of his high pretensions for one of his youth and lack of experience. Meanwhile, the composer made the most of leisure he did not really want by occupying himself with more or less creative work. One of his editorial feats of this period was a new stage version of Gluck's Iphigenie en Tauride, manifestly inspired by Wagner's treatment of the same master's Iphigenie en Olide. More important still was his first really large-scale work, Aus Italian, to which he gave the subtitle Symphonic Fantasy for Large Orchestra. He had completed the score in 1886, and on March 2, 1887, he conducted it at the Munich Odeon. To his uncle Horberger he wrote an amusing account of the first performance at which, it appears, moderate applause followed the first three movements, and violent hissing competed with hand-clappings. There has been much ado here over the performance of my fantasy, Strauss wrote his uncle, and general amazement and wrath, because I too have begun to go my own way. And his biographer, Max Steinitzer, told that the composer's father, outraged by the hisses, hurried to the artist's room to see his son, and found him, far from disturbed, sitting on a table dangling his legs one detail the composer of this symphonic italian excursion failed to notice namely that in utilizing the tune finiculi finicula for the movement depicting the colorful life of naples he was quoting not as he fancied a genuine neapolitan folk song but an only too familiar tune by luigi denza who lived much of his life in a london suburb be all this as it may, Strauss had more to occupy his thoughts than the fortunes of his Italian impressions to which he had given musical shape. In 1886-87 he composed, besides the sonata in E-flat for violin and piano, and a number of fine leader, among them the lovely and uplifting Breit über mein Haupt, the tone poem Macbeth, least known of them all. He revised it in 1890, and on October 13 of that year conducted it in Weimar. But Macbeth has been completely overshadowed by the next tone poem, of earlier opus number but later composition, the glowing, romantic, vibrant Don Juan, which has a spontaneity and an indestructible freshness that give it a kind of electrical vitality none of the orchestral works of their composer's early manhood quite rival unless we accept the masterpiece of humor till eulenspiegel itself a different proposition it had been the powerful impressions made on the composer by some of the Shakespearean productions of the dramatic company in Meiningen, which gave the incentive for Macbeth. In the case of Don Juan, the moving impulse was the poem of Nicholas Lenau, whose real name was Nimbusch von Stahlenau, and who described the hero of his work as one longing to find one who represented incarnate womanhood, in whom he could enjoy all the women on earth whom he cannot as individuals possess. Unable in the nature of things to achieve this tall order, Lenau's Don Juan falls prey to disgust, and this disgust is the devil that fetches him. Strauss gave no definite meanings to specific phases of his music, 
though he was not to want for interpreters and one of them wilhelm mauke found it preferable to discard the model supplied by lenau and to discover in the tone poem the various women who inhabit mozart's don giovanni be this as it may the score delighted the first hearers when it was played in weimar they tried to have it repeated on the spot hans von bulow wrote that his protege had with don juan had an almost unheard of success and the young composer might well have seen a good augury in the notorious edward hanslick's outcries to the effect that the score was chiefly a tumult of dazzling color dabs and in his shrieks that strauss had a great talent for false music for the musically ugly it cannot be said that he was truly happy with his munich experience and the disappointments which if the truth were known seemed for the moment to dog his footsteps he was to be sure adding to his accomplishments as a composer and plans for an opera began to stir in him moreover he had more and more chances to accept guest engagements as a conductor and such opportunities were taking him on more and more tours in germany he had striven to do his best in the city of his birth yet few seemed to be grateful for his efforts to clean up drab accumulations of routine bulow realized from long and heartbreaking experience what his friend was undergoing very few thanked the idealist for his efforts to better the musical standing of his home town end of part one Part two of Richard Strauss by Herbert F. Pieser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At what might be described as a truly psychological moment of his career, Strauss was approached by Bülow's old friend, the former Liszt pupil Hans von Bronsart, with an invitation to transfer his activities to Weimar. He had every reason to look with favor on the project. Weimar was hallowed in his eyes by its earlier literary and musical associations it had harbored goethe and schiller and been sanctified in the young musician's sight by the labors of liszt his munich friend the tenor heinrich zeller who had coached wagner roles with him had settled there and a young soprano pauline de anna the daughter of a bavarian general with strong musical enthusiasm soon followed him in proper course she was to become richard strauss's wife a high-spirited outspoken lady never disposed to mince words a source of innumerable yarns and witticisms and who saw to it that her celebrated husband carefully towed the mark pauline strauss was in every way a chapter by herself and when not very long after his death she followed him to the grave it seemed only a benign provision of fate that she should not too long survive him Strauss almost instantly infused a new blood into the artistic life of Weimar, where he settled in 1889 and remained till 1894. The worthy old court Kapellmeister Eduard Lassen was sensible enough to allow his energetic new associate complete freedom of action. True, the artistic means at his disposal were relatively modest, and at first they might well have given the ambitious newcomer pause the orchestra then contained only six first violins there was a painfully superannuated little chorus and most of the leading singers had seen better days but the conductor from munich was disturbed by none of these apparent handicaps in bayreuth he had already learned the proper way of producing wagner and even when the means were limited he tolerated no concessions all wagnerian performances had to be done without cuts or at least with a minimum of curtailments a wisecrack began to go the rounds what is richard strauss doing to which the reply was strauss is opening cuts the mouldy old settings were replaced by new ones and once when there was insufficient funds to buy new stage appointments strauss approached the grand duke with the plea that he might lay out of his own pocket a thousand marks to freshen the settings to the credit of the ruler it should be told that he refused the offer and dispersed the sum himself but strauss's reforms were far from ending there 
he once confessed that in his comprehensive job he was not only conductor but coach scene painter stage manager and tailor in short a thorough-going poobah he threw himself heart and soul into the job so much so that in spite of a small stage and limited means he produced in the presence of none other than cosima wagner a lohengrin that deeply gripped her he had symphonic concerts as well as operas to occupy him at one of the former he transported his hearers with the world premiere of his don juan the date deserves to be noted november eleventh eighteen eighty nine that same year he had composed another tone poem death and transfiguration and on june twenty one eighteen eighty nine he permitted an audience in nearby eisenach to hear it the work is program music if you will but the idea that it originally set out to illustrate the poem about the man dying in a necessitous little room and after his death struggles translated to supernal glories is wrong moreover the long accepted notion that the music is based on lines by alexander ritter is fallacious for in the first place the composer did not aim to illustrate his friend's word picture and in the second ritter wrote the poem only after becoming acquainted with the score this is what explains a certain incongruity between ritter's verses and the tones which in reality were never conceived in slavish illustration of them hanslick wrong as usual was to write misleadingly once again a previously printed poem makes it certain that the listener cannot go awry for the music follows this poetic program step by step quite as in a ballet scenario and he spoke of the score as a gruesome combat of dissonances in which the wood wind howls in runs of chromatic thirds while the brass growls and all the strings rage by this time accustomed to such critical nonsense the composer did not suffer himself to be troubled what disturbed him much more was that his old champion von bulow gave indications of no longer seeing eye to eye with him at bulow's suggestion strauss had revised and newly instrumented macbeth but the piece was to continue a stepchild soon he was increasing his output of songs and enriching leader singers with such treasures as ruhe meine seele cecilie heimliche aufforderung and morgan while only a few short years ahead lay traum durch die dämmerung nachtgesang and schlagende herzen to delight nearly two generations of recitalists strauss had always been blessed with a robust health unlike wagner for instance he never suffered from exacerbated nerves and violent extremes of unbalanced mood but at the period of which we speak he did experience one of his rare periods of illness what between his guest engagements his rehearsals the strain of composing attending to details of publication and myriad other obligations of a travelling conductor and virtuoso he came down in may eighteen ninety one with a menacing grip which sent him to bed and threatened serious complications he was resigned to anything even if he did confess dying would not be in itself so bad but first i should like to be able to conduct tristan he recovered and had his wish in eighteen ninety two but in the summer he was sick once more this time with pneumonia now it looked as if one lung were seriously threatened he was granted the vacation he requested from november eighteen ninety two to july of the succeeding year taking some works and sketches he started on the advice of his physicians for the south the convalescent with a finished opera libretto in his baggage went to repair his health in italy greece and egypt in egypt he recovered completely in the anhalter railway station berlin he was to see for the last time the mortally sick von bulow likewise journeying to egypt in a last effort to repair his shattered constitution poor bulow was not to survive the trip the wiry frame of strauss helped him over any threat of tuberculosis and not only defied any peril to his lungs but seemed actually to renew his creative powers the libretto which occupied his attention was that of his opera guntram the first and least known of his productions for the lyric stage 
Gutram is without question a stiefkind among Richard Strauss's operas. The average Strauss enthusiast's acquaintance with its music may be said to be confined to the brief phrase from it cited in the section called The Hero's Works of Peace in the tone poem Ein Heldenleben. Nevertheless, the opera cost the composer six long years of his time. It received a performance in Weimar July 12, 1894. On October 29, 1940, it was to be heard again, and once more in Weimar. Strauss tells in his little volume, Betrachtungen und Erinnerungen, that it had no more than a succès d'estime, and that its failure to gain a foothold anywhere, even with generous cuts, took from him all courage to write operas. Efforts were made late in its creator's life to revive it, all of them as good as futile. As recently as June 13, 1942, the Berlin State Opera tried, with the help of the conductor Robert Hager, to pump life into it. Strauss found not a little of the opera still vital, Lebensfähig, and felt sure it would produce a fine effect, given a large orchestra. He liked particularly in his old age the second half of the second act and the whole of the third. The book has been described as revealing the influence of Wagner. Guntram, a member of a religious order in the time of the Minnesingers, esteems the ruling duke but kills himself after renouncing the duchess, the object of his affection. Despite the dramatic resemblances to Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, Alexander Ritter found in the opera a departure from Wagnerian influences. Slowly, as Strauss labored over the three acts of Guntram, he spent no such time on the tone poems which now began to follow in rapid succession. After the ill-fated opera and a quantity of fine new leader, superbly diversified in expressive scope and lyric moods, there followed the tone poem which, apart from Don Juan, continues even in the present age to address itself most warmly to the public heart, till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks. Analysts of one sort and another have provided the work with a program which has long been accepted as standard. The composer himself declined to supply one, maintaining that the listener himself should seek to crack the hard nut till the folk rogue of ancient tradition had supplied his public. He himself would say nothing to clear up the secrets of the lovable knave who came to his merited end on the gallows. If Strauss confided to his public the nature of many of Eulenspiegel's various ribaldries and madcap adventures, he might, he maintained, easily cause offense. Concert-goers could cudgel their brains all they chose. Richard Strauss would keep his own counsel. Naturally, his work acquired, rightly or wrongly, regiments of interpreters. If nasty, noisome, rollicking Till, with the whirligig scale of a yellow clarinet in his brain, as the worthy William J. Henderson eventually described him, the irrepressible Folksnar was ultimately to become visualized as a kind of medieval ballet fable, sporting all the benefits of storybook scenery and dramatic action. The result actually was not too remote from what Strauss originally intended. Its popular musical elements, such as the fetching polka tune or Gossenhauer, the use of the folk melody Ich hat einen Kameraden, and a good deal else, seemed theatrically conceived. The use of the rondo form was ideally suited to the idea which the composer strove to formulate. At one period, Strauss, conscious of the operatic elements of Till, was moved to give the work a thoroughgoing dramatic setting and began to sketch the piece as a sort of lyric drama, or rather a scherzo with staging and action. But he lost interest in the scheme and did not progress beyond plans for a first act. Franz Wüllner conducted the premiere of Till Eulenspiegel in Cologne, November 5, 1895. It has been pointed out that if the masculine element is idealized in Strauss's tone poems, it is rather the feminine which he gives precedence in his operas. Something of an exception to this is exemplified in the next purely orchestral work, the tone poem Thus Spake Zarathustra. 
which followed less than a year later and was produced under its composer's direction at one of the museum concerts in frankfurt on the main november twenty seventh eighteen ninety six the score is described as freely after nietzsche at once there arose protests that strauss had tried to set nietzschean philosophy to music actually he had aimed to do no such preposterous thing and zarathustra posed no genuine problems if the score is the weaker for some of its syrupy and sentimental pages it includes another such as the magnificent sunrise picture at the beginning which can only be placed for overpowering effect beside the passage let there be light and there was light in haydn's creation if ever anything could testify to strauss's incontestable genius it is this grandiose page other portions it may be conceded lapse into commonplace but the close in two keys at once b and c offered one of the early examples of polytonality that duly outraged the timid Today this clash of tonalities has quite lost its power to frighten. In 1898, and for quite some time afterward, it passed for hardly less than an invention of Satan. Strauss intended this juxtaposition to characterize two conflicting worlds of ideas. Possibly it can be made to sound sharply dissonant on the piano. The magic of Strauss's orchestration, however, eliminates all suggestion of crude cacophony. On March 18, 1898, Cologne heard under the baton of Franz Wüner a work of rather different order, Don Quixote, fantastic variations on a theme of knightly character. It is a set of orchestral variations on two themes, the one heard in the solo cello and characterizing the knight of the rueful countenance, the second, solo viola, picturing his squire, Sancho Panza as a feat of individualizing these variations are a thing apart the tone painting is unrivalled in its composer's achievements up to that time a number of special effects which long invited attention over and above their real musical worth called forth considerably more astonishment than they really deserved the pitiful bleatings of a flock of sheep violently scattered by the lance of the crack-brained don his attacks on a company of itinerant monks his ride through the air amid the whistlings of a wind machine these and other effects of the sort are actually only minor phases of the score its memorable qualities aside from striking pictorial conceits are rather to be found in the moving and tender pages portraying the passing of don quixote as the mists clear from his poor addled brain there are episodes of a melting tenderness in these which rank among the most eloquent utterances strauss has attained still another tone poem was to succeed a hero's life ein heldenleben performed under the composer's direction in frankfurt the work is autobiographical with the composer himself as its hero and his helpmate obviously frau pauline his better half as she was to be called for a long time ein heldenleben passed as the prize horror among strauss's creations especially its fierce and rambunctious battle scene which some critics considered a kind of bugaboo with which to frighten the wits out of grown-up concert-goers for its day a hero's life was unquestionably strong meat if people were horrified by the racket and cacophony of the battle scene they were no less disposed to irritation at the cackling sounds with which strauss pilloried his benighted foes who resented his aims and accomplishments and they were displeased by the immodesty with which he exhibited himself as a real and misprized hero by the citation of fragments from his own works some among them as staunch a strauss admirer as romain roland were disturbed not because the composer talked in his works about himself but because of the way in which he talked about himself all the same strauss was to boast no truer champion throughout his career than the sympathetic and keenly understanding author of jean christophe ein heldenleben was the last but one of the series of tone poems which were to lead to a new phase of richard strauss's career 
the last of this series the symphonia domestica was completed in charlottenburg berlin on december thirty one nineteen o three its first public hearing took place under the composer's direction in carnegie hall new york march twenty one nineteen o four the domestic symphony dedicated to my dear wife and our boy is in one movement and three subdivisions after an introduction and scherzo there follow without break an adagio then a tumultuous double fugue and finale the reviewers discovered all manner of programmatic connotations in this depiction of a day in strauss's family life though he was eventually to tell a new york reviewer that he wanted the work to be taken as music pure and simple and not as an elaboration of a specific program he maintained his belief that the anxious search on the part of the public for the exactly corresponding passages in the music and the program the guessing as to significance of this or that the distraction of following a train of thought exterior to the music are destructive to the musical enjoyment and he forbade the publication of what he sought to express till after the concert he might as well have saved himself the trouble there is no room here to point out even a small fraction of what the critics heard in the work encouraged by a casual note or two the conductor found it necessary to set down at certain stages of the score the youngsters aunts are supposed to remark that the infant is just like his father the uncles just like his mother a glockenspiel announces that the time at one point is seven in the morning the child gets his bath and the ablutions are accompanied by shrieks and squeals husband and wife discuss the future of the baby and there is a lively domestic argument which ends happily ernest newman irritated like the numerous other reviewers by the torrents of vain talk the piece called forth was to complain that strauss behaved as foolishly over the domestica as he might have been expected to do after his previous exploits in the same line the first organization to perform the work was the orchestra of hermann hans wetzler in new york and it took several months longer for the music to reach germany mr newman had found the texture of the whole is less interesting than in any other of strauss's works the short and snappy thematic fragments out of which the composer builds contrasting badly with the great sweeping themes of the earlier symphonic poems the realistic effects in the score are at once so atrociously ugly and so pitiably foolish that one listens to them with regret that a composer of genius should ever have fallen so low more than a decade was to elapse before strauss was to concern himself again with problems of symphonic music opera and ballet were to be the chief business of these activities which one may look upon as the middle period of his creative life one may be permitted a short backward glance to account for some of his previous creations songs a number of the best of them an enoch arden setting declamation with piano accompaniment occupy the late years of the nineteenth century and the dawn of the twentieth not to mention the choral ballad for mixed chorus and orchestra Tylefer. more important however is a second operatic venture this opera in one act called feuersnot is a setting of a text by the noted ernst von volzogen who was associated with the vogue of the so-called überbrettel a sort of up-to-date vaudeville and arty movement typical of the period foyer's note is a picture of a fire famine brought about by an irate sorcerer in revenge for the act of a maiden who scorned his love thereby all the fires of the town are extinguished the piece is rather too long for a short opera and too short for a full-length one but the text is rich in word-play punning satire double meanings and topical allusions interlarded with biting reflection on the manner in which munich had once turned against wagner and on the trouble the benighted burghers would have in similarly ridding themselves of the troublesome strauss there is not a little of the real strauss in the music though at that less than one might expect from the composer of till Ovenspiegel and ein heldenleben which already lay some distance in the past 
Feuersnot was first staged at the Dresden Opera on November 21, 1901, under the leadership of Ernst von Such, and the consequence was that for years to come Strauss's operatic premieres took place in that gracious city. We now come into view of a milestone of modern music drama. In 1902, Strauss attended a performance of Oscar Wilde's play Salome at Max Reinhold's Kleines Theater in Berlin. Gertrude Eisold had the title role. The Swiss musicologist Willi Schu relates that the composer, after the performance, was accosted by his friend Heinrich Greenfeld, who remarked, Strauss, this would be an operatic subject for you. I am already composing it, was the reply, and the composer went on to tell, the Viennese writer Anton Linder had already sent me the play and offered to make an opera text of it for me. Upon my agreement he sent me some cleverly versified opening scenes, which did not, however, inspire me with an urge to composition. Till one day the question shaped itself in my mind, why do I not compose at once, without further preliminaries? Wie schön ist die Prinzessin Salome heute Nacht? From then on it was not difficult to cleanse the piece of literature, so that it has become a thoroughly fine libretto. Necessity gave me a really exotic scheme of harmony, which showed itself especially in odd heterogeneous cadences having the effect of changeable silk. It was the desire for the sharpest kind of individual characterization that led me to by tonality. One can look upon this as a solitary experience, as applied in a special case, but not recommended for imitation. Difficulties began with von Schuch's first piano rehearsals. A number of singers sought to give back their parts, till Karl Burian shamed them by answering, when asked how he was progressing with the role of Herod, I already know it by heart. A little later the Salome, Frau Wittlich, threatened to go on strike because of the taxing part and the massive orchestra. Soon, too, she began to rail against perversity and impiety of the opera, refused to do this or that because I am a decent woman, and drove the stage manager almost frantic. Strauss remarked that her figure was not really suited to the sixteen-year-old princess with the Isolde voice, and complained that in subsequent performances her dance and her actions with Joachanan's head overstepped all bounds of propriety and taste. In Berlin, according to Strauss, the Kaiser would permit the performance of the work only after Intendant von Hülsen had the idea of indicating at the close, by a sudden shining of the morning star, the coming of the three holy kings. Nevertheless, Wilhelm II remarked to Hülsen, I am sorry that Strauss composed this Salome. I like him, but he is going to do himself terrible harm with it. At the dress rehearsal, the famous high B-flat of the double basses so filled Count Seebach with the fear of an outbreak of hilarity that he prevailed upon the player of the English horn to mitigate the effect somewhat by means of a sustained B-flat on that instrument. Strauss's own father, hearing his son play a portion of the opera on the piano, exclaimed a short time before his death, "'My God, this nervous music! It is as if beetles were crawling about in one's clothing. And Cosima Wagner declared after listening to the closing scene, This is madness. The clergy, too, was up in arms, and the first performance at the Vienna State Opera in October 1918 took place only after an agitated exchange of letters with Archbishop Piffel. The orchestra of Salome in all numbers 112 players. Strauss, however, eventually arranged the opera for fewer players, and Willi Schu tells of the composer having conducted it in Innsbruck with an orchestra of only 56 players, wins in twos, but highly efficient solo instrumentalists. At all events, Strauss has been described as an inimitable conductor of Salome. Willie Shu, whom Strauss designated late in his life as his official biographer when the time came to prepare his standard life story, 
alludes to strauss as an allegro composer whose direction of salome was of altogether remarkable tranquillity and finds that the real secret of his direction of this music drama was to be sought in the restfulness and creative aspects of his interpretation which avoids every excess of whipped-up overheated effect and sensationalism it is therefore illuminating to consider the modifications the years have wrought on the interpretive treatment proper to the work little by little the legend of the decadent hysterical hypersensual work was replaced by the assurance of its almost classical character and the truth of oscar wilde's declaration to sarah bernhardt when the play was new i aimed only to create something curious and sensual has at length come to the fore end of part two part three of richard strauss by herbert f peaser this librivox recording is in the public domain there is scarcely any need to recount in any detail the early difficulties of salome in america when the scandalized cries that arose after the work received a single representation at the metropolitan opera house in new york only to be shelved as detrimental to the best interests of the institution after a solitary representation still ranks among the notorious and less creditable legends of the american stage strauss soon after this taste of the operations of american puritanism accused americans of hypocrisy the most loathsome of all vices he was handsomely avenged however when on january twenty eighth nineteen o nine oscar hammerstein revived the work with mary garden as salome at his manhattan opera house and started it on a triumphant american career which confounded all the ludicrous prognostications and horrified shouts with which it has been greeted only a short time earlier the work which followed salome was electra the text of which was the creation of hugo von hofmannsthal here began a collaboration between poet and musician which was to last with fruitful results until the latter's death and to mark some of the high points of strauss's achievements the story of their joint labors is detailed in a priceless series of letters brought out in nineteen twenty five under the editorial supervision of the composer's son dr franz strauss these letters afford glimpses into the workshop of librettist and composer which rank with some of the most illuminating exchanges of the sort the history of music supplies from them we learn that before settling on the tragedy of the house of agamemnon the collaborator seriously pondered as operatic material calderon's daughter of the air and also semiramis then early in nineteen o eight they seem to have agreed on electra hoffmannsthal's version of the greek legend based on sophocles had been acted in berlin again with gertrude isolt in the title role and no sooner had strauss witnessed the production than he concluded that the tragedy in this form was virtually made to order for his music on july sixth nineteen o eight the composer wrote to hoffmannsthal electra progresses and is going well i hope to hurry up the premiere for the end of january at the latest strauss was as good as his word the first performance of electra took place january twenty five nineteen o nine at the dresden opera ernst von schuch conducting with annie krull in the name part ernestine schumann henk as clytemnestra and karl peron as orestes if strauss would have preferred to write a comic opera after salome the pull of the genre of horror opera was still strong upon him and he was not yet ready to loose himself from its grip electra was if one chooses gorier than salome and perhaps more genuinely psychopathic but less susceptible to provocations of outraged morality its instrumental requirements are rather larger than those of strauss's previous opera and the whole more nightmarish in its sensational atmosphere one had the impression however that with electra the composer had reached the end of a path 
he could hardly repeat himself with impunity along similar lines a turn of the road or something similar must come next unless strauss's achievements were to run up against a stone wall or lead him into a blind alley this was not fated to happen what the pair were now to achieve was what was to prove their most abiding triumph der rosenkavalier of all the operas of richard strauss the most lastingly popular and if not the indisputable best at all events the most loved and peradventure the most viable and if you will the healthiest if the piece is in some respects sprawling and overwritten it does contain a piece of moving character drawing which stands with the most memorable things the literature of musical drama affords in her musical and dramatic lineaments the aristocratic marcheline whose common sense leads her on the threshold of middle age to renounce the calf love of the seventeen-year-old rose-bearer octavian offers one of the finest and most convincing figures to be found in modern opera a creation not unworthy to stand by the side of wagner's hans Sachs the baron ox an outright vulgarian if the music accorded him does not lie is a figure who might have stepped out of the pages of rabelais sophie faninal and all the rest of the characters who enliven this canvas inhabited by almost photographic types of eighteenth-century vienna add up to a truly memorable gallery with which hoffmannsthal and strauss have brought to life an era and a culture strauss's score has indisputable prolixities and commonplaces but these traits may pass as defects of the opera's qualities and as such they can take their place in the vastly colorful pageant of hoffmannsthal's comedy of manners it would be a mistake however to imagine that a piece as earthy as der rosenkavalier should pass without provoking dissent the german kaiser who had small use for strauss's operas yielded to the urging of the crown prince so far as to attend a performance then left the theatre with the words "Det is keen music für mich that's no music for me to spare the feelings of the straight-laced kaiserin it was arranged to place the marshalin's bed in an adjoining alcove instead of in high visibility on the stage when the curtain rose nor were these the only objections and of course there were the usual exclamations about the length of the piece no end of suggestions were advanced about the best ways to shorten the work strauss in protest against some of the cuts von schuch had practised in dresden once insisted he had overlooked one of the most important possible abbreviations why not omit the trio in the last act which only holds up the action it should be explained that the great trio is the brightest gem of the act perhaps indeed the lyric climax of the whole score as for the various waltzes which fill so many pages of the third act and to some degree of the second it may be admitted that for all the skill of their instrumentation they are by no means the highest melodic flights of strauss's fancy some of them being merely successions of rather trifling sequences it was assumed after der rosenkavalier that the success of the opera indicated that the composer in a mood for concessions had tried to meet the public halfway and had renounced the violence the cacophonies and the dissonances and sensational traits supposed to be his stock in trade the comedy was assumed to be a proof of this the real truth was that strauss had not changed his ideals and methods in the least it was rather that the public converted by force of habit was itself catching up with strauss and that the idiom of the composer was quickly becoming the musical language of the hour sometimes it took even a few idiosyncrasies of the musician for granted one did not always inquire too closely into just what he meant there is one case when strauss even went to the length of writing music to the words discret vertraulich discreetly confidentially when hoffmannsthal had written them as stage directions to be followed not as a part of a text to be sung all the same strauss usually kept an eagle eye on the dramatic action he composed 
with regard to the libretto of de rosenkavalier he wrote to the poet the first act is excellent the second lacks certain essential contrasts which it is impossible to put off till the third with only a feeble success for the second act the opera is doomed be this as it may de rosenkavalier was anything but doomed it was in point of fact the work which strauss had in mind when at the close of the first electra performance he remarked to some friends now i intend to write a mozart opera whether or not der rosenkavalier really meets the prescriptions of a mozart opera we feel rather more certain that his next work ariadne auf noxus comes closer to filling that bill the development of this work hangs together with production in stuttgart october twenty five nineteen twelve of a german adaptation by hoffmannsthal of moliere's comedy le bourgeois gentilhomme moliere's monsieur jourdain who has made money induces a certain charming widow the marquise d'ormene to come to a dinner he gives in her honour a reprobate noble count dorantes tells the marquise that the soiree at jourdain's home is really intended as a gesture of admiration for her m jourdain has engaged two companies of singers who are supposed to perform a serious opera ariadne on noxus and a burlesque the unfaithful zerbinetta and her four lovers both pieces are supposed to have been composed by a protege of m jourdain during a dinner scene strauss has recourse to bits of musical quotation a fragment of wagner's rheingold when rhine salmon is served and several bars of the bleating sheep music from don quixote when servants bring in roast mutton the banquet is interrupted and jourdain finds it necessary to curtail the scheduled programme as a result the young author is commanded by jourdain to combine his two works as best he can hoffmannsthal's moliere adaption in which the operatic part takes the place of the french poet's original turkish ceremony was a clumsy indeed an impractical distortion but strauss had no intention of sacrificing his composition without at least an attempt to salvage something from the wreck the ariadne portion as well as the zerbinetta companion piece were preserved but carefully detached from the moliere comedy in place of this strauss and hoffmannsthal supplied a sort of explanatory prologue whereby arrangements are made for better or worse to combine the stylized opera syria with ariadne and her rescue on a desert island by the god bacchus with the comic doings of zerbinetta and her commedia della companions in this shape the piece has succeeded in surviving and actually makes an engaging entertainment with the young composer a trousered soprano reminding one of a lesser octavian there is a considerable charming music in what is left of the originally involved and over lengthy entertainment first of all strauss has suddenly to renounce the huge overloaded orchestra of salome electra and rosenkavalier and to supplant it by a much smaller one designed for a transparent texture of chamber music in any case the definitive ariadne of noxus is a real achievement and stands among strauss's better and more memorable accomplishments in the estimation of the present writer the tenderer romantic portions of the piece excel the comic pages associated with zerbinetta and her merry crew in writing these the composer aimed to be mozartian or if one prefers rossinian by assigning the colorature soprano a florid rondo of incredible difficulties so mercilessly exacting indeed that it first moved hoffmannsthal to discreet protest eventually the composer took steps to modify some of the cruel problems of zerbinetta's solo and it is in this amended form that one generally hears this air to-day when it is sung as a concert number it would not be altogether excessive to claim that ariadne of noxus marks a midpoint in strauss's career he still had a long and fruitful life ahead of him and as it was to prove he was almost incorrigibly prolific not hesitating to experiment with one type of composition as well as another 
On the eve of the First World War, he became interested in Diaghilev's Russian ballet and the various types of choreographic and scenic art which it was to engender. Hoffmannsthal wanted him to occupy his imagination and to let the vision of one of the grandest episodes of antique tragedy, namely the subject of Orestes and the Furies, inspire you to write a symphonic poem which might be a synthesis of your symphonies and your two tragic operas. And the poet adjured him to think of Orestes as represented by Nijinsky, the greatest mimic genius on the stage today but apparently Strauss had had his fill of the Electra tragedy at this stage, and had no stomach for more of this sort of thing, whether symphonic or operatic. So he remained unmoved by Hoffmannsthal's urgings, yet the Russian ballet gave him a new idea. He thought of a pantomimic ballet conceived in the shapes and colors of the epoch of Paolo Veronese. From this conception, based on a scenario by a Count Harry Kessler and von Hoffmannsthal dealing with the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, there grew the legend of Joseph, first produced in Paris, with extraordinary scenic and decorative accoutrement on May 14, 1914. The stage was a pictorial triumph which, though the ballet was several times performed elsewhere, appears never to have been anything like the visual feast it was at its first showing. The score seems to have missed fire, and has never been reckoned among the composer's major exploits. Nonetheless, the effect of the music in its proper frame and context is compelling. What if much of it sounds like discarded leavings from Salome? Strauss confessed that from the first the pious Joseph bored him, and I have difficulty in finding music for whatever bores me. Was mich mutzt. To his dear de Ponte, as he came to call Hoffmannsthal, he gave hope, and said frankly that though the virtuous biblical youth tried his patience, in the end some holy strain might perhaps occur to him. The present writer has always felt that the Joseph Legenda is a far too maligned work, and that it would repay a conductor to disentomb the grossly slandered score, which, when properly presented, is striking theatre. On October 28, 1915, there was heard in Berlin, under the composer's direction, the first symphony, in contradiction to tone poem, Richard Strauss had written since 1886 like aus italien it was again outspokenly pictorial the composer himself wrote titles into the divisions of the score which he is said to have begun to sketch in nineteen eleven though the music was set down to the final double bar four years later some spoke of the alpen symphony as a work which a child could understand and the various scenic divisions of this alpine panorama distended as it undoubtedly is can be described as plainly pictorial the orchestra depicts successively night sunrise the ascent entrance into the forest wandering beside the brook at the waterfall apparition on flowery meadows on the alm lost in the thicket on the glacier dangerous moment on the summit mists arise the sun is gradually hidden elegy calm before the storm thunderstorm the descent sunset night on account of its length the alpine symphony has never been a favorite among strauss's achievements of tone painting indeed it may be questioned whether its sunrise scene can be compared for suggestiveness and purely musical thrill to the glorious opening picture of also sprach zarathustra strauss's symphonic excursion in the alps was succeeded by a return to opera between nineteen fourteen and nineteen seventeen which is to say during the most poignant years of the first war he busied himself with a work which was to become a child of sorrow to him, but which, to a number of his staunchest worshippers, often passes as one of his very finest achievements, Die Frau ohne Schatten, The Woman Without a Shadow, first performed under Frank Schalk in Vienna, October 10, 1919. 
for all the enthusiasm it evokes in some of the inner straussian circles this opera which combines length breadth and thickness is a real problem the writer of these lines who has been exposed to the work fully half a dozen times always with a firm resolve to enjoy it has never succeeded in his ambition though strauss and hoffmannsthal discussed the plans for the piece in nineteen twelve and once more in nineteen fourteen the first act was not finished till that year and war held up the completion of the opera three years more it has been maintained that die frau und schatten marks the combination of a recitative style with the forms of the older opera and that in it strauss has yielded to a mystical tendency Billy Brando claims that Hoffmannsthal's libretto attracted the composer and stimulated him precisely because of its obscurity, that he saw in it a series of problems to be clarified, not to say unveiled in their complexities, precisely through the agency of music. The question of motherhood lies at the root of the opera. Hoffmannsthal saw in his poem a kind of continuation of the magic flute on one hand we have the superterrestrial worlds on another the realistic scenes of the human world bound together by the demonic figure of the nurse and a new element is to be sensed in the score the powerful hymn-like character of the music overpoweringly disclosed in the music a new feature in strauss's compositions it may be questioned whether strauss was truly content with the bloodless symbolism which fills the woman without a shadow in any case at this juncture he began to long for something new somehow hoffmannsthal did not at that moment appear to be reacting sympathetically to the dramatic demands which just then seemed to be filling strauss's mind he informed hoffmannsthal that he longed for something to compose like schnitzler's Liebelei or scribes a glass of water he asked for characters inviting composition characters like the marshalin ox or a barrack in die frau ohne schatten and so when hoffmannsthal did not respond promptly he took up the pen to work out his own salvation the consequence was intermezzo a domestic comedy in one act with symphonic interludes it was produced at the dresden opera november four nineteen twenty four under fritz busch two years before that strauss had presented in vienna a two-act viennese ballet schlagerbuss whipped cream which can be dismissed as one of his outspoken failures as for intermezzo it had biographical vibrations in that it pictured a domestic episode in strauss's own experiences it had to do with a conductor robert storch and thus strauss could make amusing stage use of the unmistakable initials r s and make various allusions to the game of scat which had for years been a favorite diversion of his the music of intermezzo has never been acclaimed a product of the greater strauss and yet alfred lorenz famous for his series of eviscerating studies of the structural problems of wagner's music dramas has made it clear that the wagnerian form problems are likewise the principles which underlie such a relatively tenuous straussian score as intermezzo in spite of the dubious fortunes which were to dog the steps of an opera like the woman without a shadow the composer once again allowed himself to be seduced by a work of relatively similar character egyptian helen a somewhat tortured mythical tale based on a rather far-fetched magic fiction by von hoffmannsthal related to a phase of the trojan war in which helen is shown as wholly innocent of the ancient struggle magic befuddlements potions capable of changing the characteristics of people draughts which rob this or that personage of his memory an omniscient shell which launches oracular pronouncements and a good deal more of the sort lend a singular character to the strange fantasy in which some have chosen to discern a kind of take-off on the various drinks of forgetfulness and such in tristan and gutterdemmerung 
Egyptian Helen is the only sample of this strange stage of the Strauss who was reaching the frontiers of old age, which American music lovers had the opportunity to know. It would be excessive to claim that, either in Europe or in the Western Hemisphere, the work was a noticeable addition to the enduring accomplishments of the master. More than one began to obtain the impression that, for all the splendors of his technique, Strauss seemed to be going to seed. In the summer of 1929, Hoffmannsthal suddenly died. Some time before, he had written a short novel, Lucidor, about an impoverished family with two marriageable daughters for whom an attempt is made to secure wealthy husbands. To facilitate the marital stratagem, one of the daughters is dressed in boys' clothes. The disguised girl falls in love with a suitor of her sister, Arabella, to whom one Mandraka, a romantic Balkan youth of great wealth, pays court. The period is the year 1860, the scene Vienna. Inevitably, Arabella turned out to be something of a throwback into the scene, if not the glamorous period or milieu of der Rosenkavalier. Almost inevitably, the lyric comedy, the final product of the strauss hoffmannsthal partnership, is filled with scenes, characters, and analogies to the more famous work. In truth, Arabella is a kind of little sister of Rosenkavalier. At the same time, the texture of the score and the character of the orchestral treatment has a transparency and a delicate charm which Strauss rarely equaled, even if the melodic invention and the instrumentation suggest a kind of chamber music on a large scale. As in Ariadne of Noxus, the composer does not hesitate to make use of a florid soprano to introduce scintillating samples of ornate vocalism. One feels, however, that Arabella is a semi-finished product. The second half of the work does not sustain the level of the first. Many things might have been worked out more expertly if the librettist had been spared to supervise work, which as things stand is far from a really satisfactory or unified piece. But the score contains some of the older Strauss's most enamoring lyric pages, and it is easy to feel that his heart was in the better portions of the opera. The score of Arabella benefits by the introduction of folk songs influence, in this instance of a number of South Slavic melodies, which are among its genuine treasures. Lacking his faithful Hoffmannsthal, Strauss turned to Stephen Schweig, who had made for him an operatic adaptation of Ben Jonson's play Eposun, or The Silent Woman. On June 24, 1935, it was produced under Karl Böhm at the Dresden Opera. At once trouble arose. Hitler and the Nazis had come into power, and Zweig, as a Jew, was automatically an outcast. After the very first performances, the piece was forbidden not to be revived till after Hitler's end, and then in Munich and in Wiesbaden. It is actually a question whether the temporary loss of the Schweigsame Frau must be accounted a serious deprivation. The silent woman is a rowdy, cruel farce about the tricks played on a wretched old man, unable to endure noise, and subjected to all manner of torments, in order that he be compelled to renounce a young woman, who, to assure a lover a monetary settlement, plays the shrew so successfully that the old man is only too willing to pay any amount of his wealth to be rid of her. It is much like the story of Donizetti's Don Pasquale, and the dramatic consequences are to all intents the same. There is, in reality, nothing serious or genuinely based on musical inspiration in the opera, the best features of which are certainly set pieces, some rather adroitly polyphonic, and a charmingly orchestrated overture described in the score as a potpourri. A tenderer note is struck only at the point where, as evening falls, the old man drops off to sleep. As librettist for his next two operas, Friedenstag and Daphne, Strauss sought the aid of Joseph Gregor. The first-named work, in one act, was performed on July 7, 1938, in Munich, under Clemens Krauss. Ironically enough, this work, that aimed to glorify the coming of peace after conflict, 
was first performed with the political troubles which heralded the outbreak of the second world war visibly shaping themselves daphne bucolic tragedy in a single act also from the pen of gregor was heard in dresden october fifteenth nineteen thirty eight and gregor too supplied the aging composer with the book of die liebe der Dane, a merry mythological tale in three acts to date its sole production to date seems to have been in salzburg as a dress rehearsal august sixteenth nineteen forty four Strauss's last opera, produced under Clemens Krauss in Munich on October 28, 1942, was Capriccio, a conversation piece for music in one act, Krauss and the composer collaborating on the book. The conversation is a discussion of certain aesthetic problems underlying the musical treatment of operatic texts. It was the final work of operatic character Strauss was to attempt this did not mean however that he had written his last score far from it at eighty-one he was to complete several the real value of which may be left to the judgment of posterity they include some songs a duet concertino for clarinet and bassoon with strings a concerto for oboe and orchestra a still unperformed concert fragment for orchestra from the legend of joseph more important unquestionably is metamorphoses a study for twenty-three solo strings first played in zurich january twenty five nineteen forty six under the direction of paul sacher this work despite its length is music of suave beautiful texture a certain nobly nostalgic quality of farewell which seems to sum up the composer's life work with all its ups and downs we may allow it to go at this and to spare further enumeration of the innumerable odds and ends he was to assemble from his boyhood to the patriarchal age of more than eighty-five years or even to allude to his gross derangement of mozart's idomeneo done in nineteen thirty at munich having lived through a lively young manhood and endured the bitter experience of two world wars richard Strauss, in the end performed the miracle of actually dying of old age one might almost have looked for convulsions of nature for signs and portents at his eventual passing but his going was to be accompanied by no such things his death in garmisch september eighth nineteen forty nine was brought about by the illnesses of the flesh at more than fourscore and five he died of a complication of heart liver and kidney troubles and he died in his bed a heldenleben if you will and a death and transfiguration played against the loveliest conceivable background an incomparable stage setting of alpine lakes and heights with streams and gleaming summits furnishing a glorious backdrop for his resting place end of part three end of richard strauss by herbert f peaser